we of course want to see a system where we begin to change the world in which we live. Much of what's been said today has addressed that problem. But also arising out of the speech made on behalf of the NEC by Ken Capstick, I want to bring to a conclusion my remarks by referring not just to the environment but to the problems of inequality and injustice throughout the world. The fact is that here we are in the 21st century. We've got people running around in the environmental movement, mainly coming from middle class homes and taking their tents to Kings North where I joined them. And I told them during my talk to them that there are people in what we term the third world would give anything not to have their comfortable lifestyle at home, but to have the bloody tent that they had at King's North. And they don't seem to understand the problems that are now affecting people throughout the world. We're seeing nations, not merely in Africa, not merely in parts of Southeast Asia, where there are dust bowls, droughts of unimaginable proportions, where they haven't had rain for four or five years. And yet at the same time, we've got rising sea levels. Sea levels that are continuing to rise and people are talking about how can we hold it back from eroding the coastline. Well, the answer is simple, isn't it? Why don't we begin to utilise the seawater and change it into clean water by desalinisation? It would do two things. It would make the deserts of the world bloom and it would lower the sea level. It seems to me to be the most common sense approach that any political organisation can take. Just imagine, I'm not talking about somewhere that's confined to Africa. It's happening in America, where there are dust bowls near Las Vegas. It's happening in Australia, throughout the outback. They've got nothing. They haven't had rain for five years. And yet, by simple using of the oceans and turning them by desalinisation into clean water, we save millions of lives, but we also do something better. We begin to provide the wherewithal to grow food. And it is the right of every human being in the 21st century to have enough to eat, to have a house in which to live, to have clothing, and to have education and a health service. The basic necessities of life. If we really are a so-called civilized society, then all of us should be fighting to change those inequalities and injustices that we see every day on our television screens or hear on our radios or read in the newspapers. Comrades, this party was founded because there was no party in existence which saw in a clear cut way what to do about the problems that we face. I am absolutely convinced that we have the policies. Nobody has ever challenged the sense of our constitution. Even our opponents recognise that our manifesto, by a mile, is the best manifesto of any political party. If for no other reason than it's been costed. And we can show each of our policies and how we can pay for them. <coughs> yes, can we are wanting to stand not only in the European elections, but in the general elections and the local elections as well. And if people will accept what I'm going to say now, this party can restate what it did in 1999, when we obtained in Britain about 1% of the total vote in the European elections. Nearly 2% in London, when John Hayball and I were at the count, when the first five results came in, we thought we got a seat. What we did was to poll an amount of people in this country that would give us nearly a million on a pro rata basis if everybody had taken part in the poll. If anybody believes in opinion polls, it demonstrates that the opinion in support of our party is there. We missed the election in Scotland by a quarter of a percent. The opportunities are there. But if we're going to stand, Kai, in the European elections, I'll tell you where we're going to stand. We're going to stand everywhere in every European constituency in order that our message goes across. And it's incumbent upon all of us 
to participate in those elections. In this paper written by James Connolly, he said that we will stand against those who falsely claim to represent the working class in every general election and local municipal election. Well, we'll add to that and in every European election so that we can bring an end to the European Union and get back into the world so that we can rightfully take our place amongst all the peoples of the world. Socialism is not merely a dream. Socialism is a reality that can be achieved. I am firmly convinced that with the kind of party that we have, all that we need to do is to relate what we've done today into the areas where we belong. Hold public meetings, tell people what we stand for, explain why they should join our party. Yes, stand candidates by all means, but as others have said, hold recruiting meetings. We'll fight alongside people like Ricky Tomlinson. Next year is the 25th anniversary of the historic miners strike and already UCAT are asking the SLP if we will combine with them on a lobby of Parliament in support of the Shrewsbury Six in order to gain justice and on the same day hold a mass rally in London to commemorate the historic 1984-85 miners strike when we saw not merely resistance from miners but we saw the magnificent women's support group take on this government and take on in every possible way those injustices to which I've referred. You know, people often ask me what was the greatest memory of the miners' strike of 1984-5. I'll tell you what I said, because I'll never accept that the miners were defeated. The greatest victory of all was the struggle itself. And don't forget when you look at the history of Cuba, in Cuba they celebrate the battle at Moncada. And at Moncada they were defeated according to some. But had it not been for the struggle at the Moncada barracks, they would never have achieved the socialist republic they have in 1959. And as Magaki used to say and Willa Gallagher before him, we we'll go from defeat to defeat to defeat and on to final victory. That's the message of the Socialist Labour Party onwards to socialism. <laughs>